I came home crying and yelling at my mom like, you never told me I was a boy. Hey guys, it's Kirby. Welcome back to Pretty Unfiltered. So as you guys know, it is Pride Month. We are celebrating all things pride. And today we're talking about what it means to be intersex. So one in 200 people are born intersex. Today I have Emily Quinn, host of Intersex Experiences on YouTube. She's gonna talk to us about what it means to be intersex, all the questions that you have, we're gonna answer them because she's intersex herself. So Em, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Okay, so actually Em, before we got started, I initially did a first take of this and she corrected me on a statistic that I had researched, mm -hmm. which I'm glad that you did because mm -hmm. initially I said one in 2,000 people are born intersex, but it's one in 200. Yes. And then how did you correct me? What did you say? I said that intersex people are about 1.7% of the population, which is the same statistics as redheads, naturally born redheads. That's so crazy. So yeah. let's just, for those that might not know what the term means, mm -hmm. what is intersex? So intersex describes people whose biology doesn't fit the typical definition of male or female and that's it's an umbrella term to describe all sorts of different variations and traits and sex characteristics. So what makes you intersex? So for me particularly, um, I have XY chromosomes and internal testes. So I usually say it takes a lot of balls to talk about this <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and because internally I have testes and XY chromosomes, no uterus, no period, no ovaries, that sort of thing. And just to clarify, women usually have XX, right? Correct, okay. yeah. Usually, typically, women have XX chromosomes, men have XY chromosomes, but there's a whole variety of possibilities. Those aren't your only options for chromosomes. You can have XO chromosomes or XXY or XXXY. There's so many variations, um, but people only ever talk about XX or XY, but people can have all sorts of different chromosomes. Okay, so how old were you when you first found out you were intersex? I know that this can kind of be a controversial topic depending mm -hmm. on how it happened for you, but mm -hmm. are you okay talking yeah, about it? Yeah, Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm open. Per open uh, book, love yeah, that. Yeah, open book. Um, I was 10 when I found out I was intersex, so okay. I went to the gynecologist, which as a lot of people who've been to a gynecologist know, it's not fun at any age. But you went at 10. At 10, That's yeah. so young, yeah. to be perfectly honest. Oh, no, and we knew, my mom took me because she knew I might be intersex, actually. Oh, so okay. She okay. took me, and um, intersex for me actually runs in my family. It's hereditary. Wow. So we have, I have about two or three intersex aunts and cousins, and so my mom knew it's possible. So okay, that's wait. Why she took me so in. then this is a great, I love this because. So when you were born, mm -hmm. did the doctors mention anything to your parents? No. No. They, mm -mm. Did they purposefully do that? Or um, do you think that they, I mean, they had to be I don't, aware. No, I don't think they knew. Really? Yeah, so for my variation, it usually people don't find out until they are usually trying to get their period or not getting their period or okay. not going through a typical puberty. Uh -huh. So for me, that's why I went when I was 10, because my mom didn't want me to have all these expectations that I would be getting my period and, you know, going through all the same sort of period or puberty like milestones that my friends were going through. So she took me in so that I had like the right expectations for my body. Wow. That was yeah. smart of her, obviously. Yeah, exactly. So then when you found out, how did that affect you maybe emotionally or mentally? You know, if at all, um, originally, like right in the moment when I found out it wasn't too hard. I think when I when I talk to people about this, kids are very open to all sorts of variations and differences. If you just kind of tell it to them point blank and kind of tell them the facts, it's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. I think what later was hard and emotional for me is dealing with society's expectations of me and society's ideas of being a woman or, or sex and gender. And that's that's what really started to cause problems. So um, originally, I, didn't, I found out that I had XY chromosomes, but mm -hmm. I didn't know that that usually meant boy chromosomes. So... Two years later, in my seventh grade year, um, I found out that boys have XY chromosomes, and I came home crying and yelling at my mom, like, you never told me I was a boy, and like freaking out, and that was like, I feel like that was really a big defining moment for me, and then it also, it was hard for me and my mom because we didn't have the same trust anymore. For me, it was kind of, it was just always, there was this, always a fear of people finding out. And I think both my doctors and my parents had told me not to talk about it. And for them, it was a fear of me getting bullied. Yep. And it was out of love that they told me not to talk about it because they didn't want me to, you know, just they didn't want me to be bullied or to be ashamed of it. But the secrecy ended up causing a lot of shame and it caused a lot of like stigma in myself. And I really, 
um, I was scared people would find out. And so whenever someone asked me for a tampon, for instance, in, in middle school or high school, I was always like, no. And it's, it's a fine thing to say no. But like for me, I was like, no, and please don't find out that I like don't have a period. And like it has all of these internal mental things that start going on. When yeah, like I'm saying no because I don't need them, not mm -hmm. I'm saying no because I just don't have one. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's so much to think about, especially when you're growing up and you have so many other things on top of that, like wanting to yeah. feel cool or like making sure you have your grades on, you yeah. know, on point. And then this on top of it is just another factor. So did you ever struggle with self-confidence growing up? Uh, no, <laughs> no, of course not. You're like, come on now. <laughs> no. But what did you do to, you know, it takes, you know, no pun intended, but it takes a lot of balls <laughs> to like get on the internet and say this stuff, you mm -hmm. know? So then how do, how did you find the confidence in yourself and reassurance in yourself to just lay it all out there. So I actually knew I was going to be doing this when I was like 12. That was the first time I knew I wanted to be talking about this. And it was not so much that I wanted to talk about it, but it was I was doing so much research online and nobody was talking about it positively. Mm -hmm. And I just, it didn't seem right that, that this way that I was, that I was born, that who I was 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 bad or wrong or, or yeah. shouldn't be talked about in a positive way. And so that was, I knew then I was like, if, if by the time I'm ready, whenever that is, it was just kind of something like in my head, I knew that I would talk about it so that we could change the narrative so that people would be talking about it in a positive way. Um, but what took that is me meeting other intersex people. When I was 22 was the first time I met other intersex people. And it was just, Realizing that we've all gone through these same experiences, that we've all dealt with the same shame and the same stigma and the same awful medical interventions, that was really, I, I once I realized that, it was like I had to do something. It wasn't, it, it wasn't so much that I had the confidence anymore, that it was just that I was in a place to make a change and make difference and... Um, make a difference and I wanted that to happen I guess. How did you meet them? Did you get online? Mm -hmm. Okay yeah I, I love went, that. Yeah I went to a support group uh, AAS DSD support group here in the U.S. and there's really only one intersex support group in the U.S. Wow. and we only meet once a year um, but just kind of meeting others was just so empowering and um, for the first time I was talking in a, in a circle with a bunch of girls that we were talking about how like how we don't understand periods and we don't get that and it's kind of like a weird thing it's not a weird thing but a weird thing that we didn't understand yeah and so that sort of just kind of empowering like sense of finally meeting people who've been through what you've been through was really awesome and I didn't want anybody else to have to be going through all the same shame and stigma and horrible treatment that we went through as kids so I think that's a great takeaway Emily because getting online mm -hmm. can help support save uh, guide you, especially totally. if you're feeling alone. So if you feel like you don't have anyone to talk to in real life, yeah. going online can be a really great way to meet other people who are like-minded, who might be going through the same exact thing as you. Okay, so then my question for you is, do you identify as LGBTQ? I identify as LGBTQIA+. Okay. Um, the I is usually followed by, or followed after the Q, and that means intersex. And we often talk about the I doesn't stand for invisible. Um, so I definitely identify with that. Uh -huh. um, and I definitely identify as queer just because I feel like my experiences and relationships and um, just kind of being who I am, is that's a good umbrella term that kind of covers it because people don't really understand a lot of this narrative or these conversations. So it's just kind of an easy like catch-all to be like, yep, yeah, like, <laughs> done. Like, I don't have to worry about this. Like, it's good. So... That's the hard part. When you come out as LGBTQ, people understand it to a certain degree. They mm -hmm. at least have heard of it, whatever it is you're coming out as. But when you come out as intersex, it's always a much bigger conversation. And I have this business card that's like, just says, um, ask me about being intersex. And then in small print, but only if you have 10 minutes to spare. Yeah. <laughs> and it's that sort of thing. Like you have to have a lot of time to have these conversations and, and talk about it. I think people often get fixated on genitals and what that looks like. And even on YouTube, I get those sort of questions all the time, like, oh, what is what does it look like, or what does she look mm -hmm. like, that sort of thing. And um, it's not about genitals. The fact that people think that it's it's different is like, it's all, we're all different. And yep. like, the fact that people think that we could all have the same exact looking genitals, but that we all have very different noses, or very different ears, or 
whatever it is, like that makes no sense to me. We all have, every person has the same tissue. And, and so you can't have like tissue that is a fully functioning vagina and vulva and also a fully functioning penis. Like it's all, it's all one thing that we all start off the same in the womb. Mm -hmm. So the fact that people even think that, that it's, that it's yeah. both, <laughs> that possible that we have both, that it's kind of like, that's just a lack of understanding about human biology. And, and that's probably the biggest crux of the problem in our society too. Uh, is yeah, like that's a great clap back. Sexuality. It's like, do you understand biology? Let yeah. me just lay this out for you. Emily, thanks for coming on the show. Of course, thank this you so much awesome. for having me. This was awesome. Okay, so tell us what's going on. How are things going with intersex experiences? Like what can we look out for moving forward? Um, look, uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> look for me on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. Um, or Instagram. I have all sorts of like media projects. That's what I'm really focused on. And it's like storytelling for communities like ours who don't have our stories told very often. Great. Um, so you can find me online. Yay, we're gonna link to all of Emily's socials and YouTube channel below. Also let me know in the comment section as usual, your favorite part of this interview, what you wanna learn more about, topics, guests that you wanna see on the show. We always listen to you guys. So uh, if you suggest someone, we might just get them on the show. As always, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kirby Johnson, and we'll see you next time. Happy Pride Month. Bye.